We live in a time in history when multiple cataclysmic forces converge. Racism, misogyny, homophobia, extreme income inequality, and our changing climate, just to mention a few. And while all of these are extremely concerning, it is out of this concern that an unprecedented opportunity emerges. This moment really demands that we show up, stand up, and step up like never before. So many of us have been waiting to get involved, wanting to take action, but what were we waiting for? Well, we were waiting for the horrible thing, the worst case scenario that it would inspire us to finally take action. And that is the great gift of this moment. If we treat climate change as the true planetary emergency that it is, it will be a galvanizing force for humanity, a force that puts the long-term success of all of us over the short-term economic gains of a very few. A force that no matter what your political party is, your race, your gender, a force that will inspire us all to get involved, to be engaged, to be active participants in creating the world we want. For me, wanting to make a difference began in fourth grade. So, I ran for office. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't know what sergeant at arms even was, <laughs> or why we needed one in grammar school. <laughs> but I knew that participating was important. My dad took me aside and said, Heidi, if you're going to run for office, you need a slogan, and a slogan that rhymes. Well, there's not a whole lot that rhymes with Heidi, but Mighty does. <laughs> so it was, vote for Heidi, because Heidi is Mighty. <laughs> and that stuck. And it was the 1970s, and with my amazing Wonder Woman posters and my super cool slogan, I thought for sure I was going to win. But I didn't. And I thought that that would probably be the end of my admittedly pretty short political career. <laughs> After high school, I moved to San Luis Obispo to go to the local junior college and then to attend Cal Poly University. Almost right away, I got married, and soon after that, my daughter Zoe was born, and a couple of years later, Jack was born. <laughs> I know. They're pretty great. <laughs> I started to look at my life through the lens of being a mother and try to figure out what it meant to raise kids in today's world. I really felt that the best thing that I could do to create a better world was by raising better people. Soon after they were born, I became a multitasking single mom, an overworked house cleaner, and a B-level artist. As I scrubbed the floors of other people's homes day after day with my two kids in tow, I would dream about what my life might be like when they grew up. I thought for sure I would be living in Berlin in an artist's loft, making paintings and drinking cocktails. But then, as so often happens, some guy comes along and alters all your plans. <laughs> it's one of my guys. When former vice president and early climate champion Al Gore's film An Inconvenient Truth came out, it really changed the trajectory of my life. It was through his work that I began to understand the urgent nature of climate change, and I realized that my children's lives were at stake, and that all of our children's lives are at stake, and that I knew it wasn't going to be enough for me just to understand that fact that I had to do something. 
Because whatever issues inspire us, knowledge alone isn't enough. Because knowledge without action is meaningless. So I wanted to get involved, and I kept looking around, waiting for someone to follow, waiting for someone to take the lead here locally, and as no one emerged, I started to wonder, could that person be me? But I didn't think that I was at all the kind of person to do this type of work. It was essential to me to be my true self. And while I was an expert in getting kids to wake up and get out the door, I had no experience in getting groups of people to wake up to the world and get involved. But it turns out what I lacked in experience, I made up for in courage. Even though I was really scared of what that was going to look like, I didn't want to speak in front of groups. <laughs> I was afraid of being judged of messing up, of not knowing enough. But the important thing for me and, and the important thing for all of us is not to get it right. It's not to win. It's to begin. Begin exactly how we are and where we are. So I grabbed one of my favorite dresses, got a trusty clipboard, put a rose in my hair, and headed out the door to try and figure out how to be the leader that I had been looking for. I started small. I joined with groups of people that shared my concerns. I organized marches. I started groups. I left groups. I joined groups. I had important conversations with people of all types of viewpoints. After a while, I still felt like I wasn't quite doing enough, and I wanted to do more, so I tried new things. Not all of them were successful. I went to Texas to join the Tar Sands Blockaders, a group of really committed, extremely disheveled, eco-anarchists <laughs> living in the woods, trying to put a stop to this pipeline. As you might imagine, I was so out of place there that I'm pretty sure that they thought that either the FBI or their parents had sent me to spy on them. <laughs> Other things I tried were more successful, though. I joined a group called 350.org, one of the most renowned international groups on climate change. All right. <laughs> And we were able to put a stop to dangerous oil trains set to roll through this community. Mm -hmm. This came after years of organizing and dedicated work. All of this really in an attempt to get our elected officials to do the right thing. Activists spend a lot of time outside the halls of power, hoping that those inside make the right decisions. I realized that we needed to not just be on the outside demanding the right thing, but on the inside doing the right thing. Because it's not enough just to march in the streets. We need to march onto our school board and into our city halls and onto Congress to make the changes that we really need. Because we need elected officials that care more about the next generation than they do about their next election. So, I was ready, not only to show up, but to step up in a way that I might be able to make a bigger impact. And the 2014 state assembly race was my opportunity. My opponent was a gas station owning, fossil fuel money taking, longtime politician. And I knew I didn't really stand a chance to win in the traditional sense. 
But I also knew this was a great opportunity to make a change. And I learned that it's really not political experience, but really it's political will that we need to make an impact. By the end of my campaign, my gas station owning competitor was posing in front of giant solar fields talking about renewable energy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I knew then that even though technically I had lost, ultimately this campaign had been a victory. But after that, I was certain this time, that was it. That's the end of my political career for sure. But later that year, I, I went to a conference and across a crowded room, <laughs> I met the man who would become the love of my life. I see you've got some competition for that. He's my ride or die. He's my ride or die. <laughs> I so admired the way that Bernie had transitioned from activist to elected and loved how he was able to inspire a whole new generation of people to get engaged. I was sitting in the front row at the national convention when he said his goodbyes and left the stage. It was devastating and so disappointing. And I was one of those people that you might have seen on TV with tears streaming down my face, clutching my future to believe in sign in my hands. And in that moment, I really felt like giving up. But Bernie's parting words kept ringing in my ear. Don't get mad, go home and run for office. <laughs> so... <laughs> I did both. At first, I got mad and I stayed mad. And I didn't leave the house for three days. But on that third day, instead of giving up, I got up, grabbed my clipboard, put the rose back in my hair, and decided once again to run for office. And after a really short campaign with very little political experience and the odds stacked against me, I was elected mayor of San Luis Obispo by 46 votes. <laughs> After that election, someone I had never met before came up to me and said, uh, wow, you make me feel like literally anyone could be mayor. <laughs> and I'd like to think that was a compliment. Because if I can be mayor, you can be mayor. And that means no matter what issues inspire us, we can do literally anything. So many of the things I have been fighting for for so long on the outside, things people would tell me over and over again were impossible, the city is now bringing to life. We've committed to being a net zero city, which is a city that creates as much renewable energy as it takes to support all that live here. <laughs> and for the first time in our history, climate action is one of our major city goals. <laughs> We're fighting to create more affordable housing in the hopes of diversifying our city. And we are a welcoming city, which means that we stand in support of undocumented people here. <laughs> We've 
created safe routes for cyclists and have adopted a core philosophy of better relationships with both the campus and the community. And yes, we are fixing the potholes. <laughs> Yay, potholes. <laughs> a community really gains in strength by the ideas and intention, intentions and character of its people. Engagement is an essential aspect to democracy, and at a time when it is more difficult than ever to be politically engaged, the people of San Luis Obispo's engagement is at an all-time high. Yeah. There you go. We often show up for one another when there's been a disaster as we've seen in the aftermath of so many recent tragedies. And it's in the everyday moments that we need to show up. Because standing in solidarity with people is more than just a sentiment. It's more than posting on Facebook. Solidarity takes action. Because ultimately, solidarity is a verb. It's when immigrant children's rights are threatened that we need to speak up for those whose voices are oppressed. It's when mosques are burned that we need to stand hand in hand with our Muslim friends to talk about what freedom really means. It's when people of color are killed across this country that we need to listen to their voices to understand what it looks like to support them. And it's when queer students in our own backyard are discriminated against that we need to step up and be active allies, not silent bystanders. And it's also when our elderly neighbor is alone and we bring her a cup of tea and conversation. And it's when we invite our friends and neighbors over to share a meal around our table. This is how we build a movement one cup of tea at a time. The friendships I have made, the relationships I have built, and the unexpected moments of joy are now what bring meaning to my life. Because while we are building this movement, this movement is building us. People that take active and engaged stances in their communities, they make great elected officials. They can get it done. They can galvanize the community. They are the consensus builders and the visionaries we need to make change. Showing up will lead us towards our true destiny, towards the thing that we're born to do. We must show up. Maybe for you, that's showing up to a meeting or a conversation or a march. Maybe for you, that's stepping up to a board position in your organization or mentoring a young person. Maybe for you, that's looking at your life through the lens of social justice to be part of creating a more fair, just, and sustainable world. Maybe for you, as it was for me, it's running for office. This is where our stories will unfold. This is how we create a life of purpose, a life of meaning. It doesn't matter our age or our gender or our experience. It doesn't matter whether we won or lost in fourth grade. Our potential doesn't hinge on what we already know it hinges on what we're willing to do. So when something speaks to you so deeply that you must act, then act. Do the thing you can't not do. This is how we make the impossible the inevitable. Thank you.